Bible form. On the Bible form, periodically, we have a, a segment called the Sunday Sermon. And this falls in that category. I've entitled the sermon, Why? Why is the world running away from God and toward moral chaos? Why is the world intent on creating a new form of Christianity with a new gospel and a new worship form? And why are you going along with it? But you say, I'm not going along with it. Well, I want you to think about it a little bit. What does the word Christian mean to you? Does it mean a commitment to God in Christ regarding your salvation? And do you know the definition of the word commitment? Does it mean commitment to God in Christ <clears throat> in terms of how you live? In terms of how you worship? In terms of how you grow as a Christian? In terms of how you treat other people? How you relate to life? Today, in 21st century America, our church structures are largely man-made. They are probably borrowed from the Roman Catholic model. Of, think about the Reformation. These folks were all part of the Catholic Church at that point, moved over, uh, developed worship forms. It weren't a lot different. Our commitment to God today is largely in what we say not necessarily in what we do. Our church life is largely entertainment. We sit, we listen, we sing. We sing the songs we like because they're more peppy, more melodic. If we're honest, church is about what the preacher says and what the preacher does maybe how he says it. There is very little serious spiritual involvement in churches today. We've even changed the definition of worship to mean the singing of songs. Not that singing can't be worship, but that's not all there is to it. And in church after church after church, you're sitting there and someone says, comes out on the platform, okay, we're going to have our, we're going to worship now. Stand up and you, for 20 minutes, you stand there and you sing. Singing can very well be worship, but that's not the sum total of it. In our churches, we know what's going to happen. And we know that very little of it involves us, except putting money in a plate or maybe singing the songs. That's it. We even know what's going to be said. But very little of that is going to really be embraced, meaning that it's going to change our thinking, which will change our behavior. We go to church, we bring our worries, our fears, our doubts. We bring our goals, our needs, our desires. And after time in church, we leave, and we leave largely the way we came in. The smaller the church, the more likely we will actually worship. The more likely we will actually be spiritually fed, spiritually uplifted, spiritually encouraged. What we find in most of our churches is that all of this is superficial. Yeah, we learned something. Yeah, we were encouraged. We were uplifted, but we walked out and an hour later we couldn't tell you what was done or said and we feel the same as we did before. But we like those larger churches. Why? 
Why do we go to the churches we like because of the way they make us feel? I just like the larger churches. Well, because it's about me. I want to be ministered to. I don't want to be ministering to other people. I want to be uplifted, encouraged, challenged, fed from the Word of God. I don't want to be counted on, expected to be an active participant. I want to sit in the back. I want to soak up whatever is being offered. And then I want to go home without getting too involved. That there are others in that room with me who are struggling, hurting, fearful, discouraged, damaged, doesn't occur to me. You see, it's really about me. And I've searched out a church that makes me feel good, makes me feel welcome. I've searched out a church where the preacher offers intellectually challenging, structurally interesting, and not too pointed sermons. A church where the people are friendly without being pushy. I don't want to have a relationship with these people. I simply want to be in church. Oh, and I'll be encouraged, not used. We had a, a lady come into our church this morning, just as the preacher started to preach. And if you've been to church, you know that's at least halfway through. And she walked right down front and sat on the front pew. She did not seem to know what was happening. I mean, she knew she was in church and all that, but what's happening now, we don't know. And as the pastor was preaching, he noticed her. I noticed in him uh, that there was a hesitation. His mind, his brain went another way all of a sudden. He had to kind of get back. And he continued. He went through this. After the service was over, it is up to me, I am the song leader, to lead the congregation, usually in one verse of the closing hymn. The pastor goes down in front of the communion table, and as people have need or want prayer or come forward, uh, you know, he's there to meet, greet, whatever. And he went down and immediately went to this woman. And as we finished the first verse, it was clear he wasn't finished, so we did another verse. And then we closed the service. He prayed, and while he prayed, I purposed. I purposed that when it was over, I would go down and spend the time with her that he could not spend. And we finished, and he left and went out the room. I then... I'm up front, I'm at the pulpit, I gather my songbook, I go down the steps. The time it took me to get down there, three women had already made it up front and were talking to this lady. That's church. No idea what was going on. I assume this woman was in deep turmoil and I know for sure that she was given the gospel. You say she didn't need gospel, she needed money. Well, maybe, and that may come too. But she had a heart problem before she had a financial problem. She had a heart problem before she had a relationship problem. She had a heart problem before she had a legal problem. And if you go to work on all of the results, you may never get to the heart problem. Church is not a hospital. It's not a, a police department. It, you know, it, it's not all the, ser the services that are available. We have a service. We offer encouragement. We offer love. We offer the gospel, which is liberating. And we off offer family. People who will gather around people to encourage, uplift, and help them as much as possible. 
Maybe you want a church where you can be involved with people spiritually. Maybe you'd like to be involved with them socially, not so much spiritually. But this is what church is today, 21st century. And I'm talking about good churches. The larger, more wealthy, more active churches are completely different. In those churches, it's more about the staging. It's more about how you feel, the atmosphere. It's going to church with people who are like me. People who are in my station of life, my age, my, my kind of people. I don't want to go to church where there's a lot of young people. I'm older. I don't want to go where there's a lot of older people because I'm younger. I don't want to go with people that don't have a lot of money because I make a lot of money and I know what it's like to be with people that don't have a lot of money. And if they find out I make a lot of money, this is not going to work well. It's about hearing an interesting or a challenging sermon. Being able to say, I go to an active, vibrant, large church. Now, the fact that I only go for an hour a week, that, that's not a problem because that's all my spirit needs. Well, consider what the Apostle Paul believed about church. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul wrote, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. You're a Christian. You have all the spiritual blessings available in heavenly places in Christ. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Did you note all the him, he, who? <laughs> it's all about him. The Apostle Paul believed that we needed God's grace. Initially, salvation is by God's grace. Grace gives without any strings attached, as it were. Grace is that power from God that you don't have, but that you need if your heart is not right. Over the long haul, God's grace is what sustains and empowers and keeps us. That work of God, which we do not deserve, that work of God which protects, guides, informs, empowers, enlightens. For what purpose? Paul says that we might be able to live the Christian life. You can't do it without God's grace, that power. Paul also emphasized the need for peace. He said, peace to you, peace in you, peace as a gift from God. That quietness of soul, quietness of spirit, which comes from God and resides in his children. You don't have peace? I would ask you, are you saved? If you answer, I am saved, then I say, what are you doing? <laughs> peace comes with salvation. What are you doing to disrupt it? 
Are you too much involved in, enamored of, captured by the world? This peace is a gift from God. God, our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you doing to drive that peace away? Paul also emphasizes the gift of God, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Those spiritual blessings are in Christ. You can't get them anywhere else. And we have no idea the scope of what this entails. It's not a physical blessing. And it resides in heavenly places only in Christ. Verse 4, given only to those whom the Father hath chosen. And here's where it gets really deep. Chosen before the foundation of the world, before there was a world. Chosen before it existed. And he finishes the sentence saying, chosen to be holy. Chosen to be blameless in the sight of God. And to have all of this in heavenly places, in Christ. These are fixed places where this blessing resides. Verse 5, inasmuch as God has predestinated, literally means limited in advance, believers. To what? To the adoption of children. And that according to the good pleasure of his will. It's not because we deserve it. And to the praise of the glory of his grace, in which he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins by the riches of his grace. In verse 8, he talks about this redemption. How God has abounded, literally super abounded, toward us. It's an in indication of direction in terms of wisdom, spiritual wisdom, godly wisdom. It's about prudence and moral insight and mental alertness. How many decisions have you made without consulting God? Now, I know if you've been saved for a long time, you're well, well versed in the Word of God. A lot of times, those decisions you know because you've been there, you've seen them, and you know what the Bible says. But you've got something you just can't take care of. You, you can't figure out what's the right thing to do. How many of those decisions have you just blindly gone off without consulting God? And how many of those decisions have turned out to be great? Just what was needed. You do realize making a godly decision may not give you what you want. And making a decision that's not in harmony with God, as great as it is, as fulfilling as it might be, ultimately, it's none of that. A godly decision may not be seen for the good that it is until much later. The goal is to honor God with your decisions. Not do only that which enriches or empowers or impresses other people. Verse 10, he talks about that in the dispensation, the administration of what God calls the fullness of times, meaning at the time God is appointed which is still yet future, that he, God, might, meaning that he will, gather together in one all things in Christ. Nothing will be outside of Christ. Things in heaven, things on earth, it will all be in him. Verse 11, the one in whom we have obtained an inheritance. And how have we done that? having been predestined according to, down from, out of, the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. 
Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory. We who first, before all this happened, trusted in Christ. This is what life on this planet is all about. It's not about you. Why did God leave you here after you were saved? You're here to make him look good. That's the working definition of the word glory, to glorify God. Our daily lives should reflect upon God in only good ways. What we say, where we go, how we live, how we respond. If we are not part of a group where a dirty joke is being told, but we can hear it and we laugh at it. Do you really think no one notices that? Is this how you actually view salvation in all of these intricate ways that it's all about God? Or do you view your salvation as merely fire insurance? I don't want to go to hell. It is much richer than that. Are all of these things your goal, your purpose in life? Or have you made a profession of faith and you're still living according to the world system with worldly goals? I would suggest to you that if, if you don't have these heavenly goals in mind, if you're not looking at these godly character qualities and all the rest of it, you may not be saved. Somebody's told you praying this prayer makes it work for you, but it doesn't. And if you're in that kind of a situation, you are being deceived. You have been deceived and you are continually being deceived and continually being redirected and very often discouraged. Discouraged from actually living the Christian life. And I can say that because 21st century popular Christianity doesn't have a clue. Because the popular Christianity today is so much easier than the real thing. Because your level of commitment is not much better than that of the unsaved person who's living a decent life. And that's popular Christianity at the end of the age. And I would challenge you, don't be a part of it. It doesn't satisfy. It doesn't protect. It doesn't glorify God. And if there's no reality to it, there's no heaven at the end. You are projecting all the wrong things. There are people in your life who are desperately seeking help, seeking hope. You're a Christian. They think you have the answer. They think you have what they need. And if you are a Christian... Don't hide it under a bushel. Live it. Live it boldly. Live it consistently. Live it for Jesus' sake. We don't know how much more time we got. 